Good afternoon, my name is Stephen Cabaldo of Ikad Unity Ministries in North Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, welcome, thank you for listening. Uh, we're, on, uh, we're in June now, Wednesday, June 3rd, 2015. Another great day here, after some days of rain. So uh, let's just uh, get right into it. Um, today, I'll have a message on humility, a little bit about true humility, and a little bit about false humility. And it's important, I think, to contrast both because uh, we know that any any righteous thing that is created by God, you know, can be counterfeited by the kingdom of darkness, and it can be counterfeited in a way that it looks almost like the true thing. And that's the thing we always have to be uh, aware of, and, and that's where we have to use great discernment, is that something that is false sometimes looks uh, almost true. You know, it's so close to the, to the real thing that, uh, that we can be deceived. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about humility in a few passages. Before we do that, we just uh, come to you again, Father, and we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all the blessings that you pour out on us and what you do for us in our lives. Uh, watch over all the people who listen and uh, help, help them understand what your path is for them and, and help this ministry bring glory to you in the way that, uh, that, that you desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so uh, today we'll go first to Proverbs chapter 22, and uh, we'll read a little bit about humility and, and, and what happens uh, if, if you have that, uh, that, uh, that meekness and uh, that, f that flexibility of spirit. In other words, you're open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, this is sort of, uh, that's sort of a, uh, a, sign mark, a sign or a hallmark of, of humility is that you are f uh, spiritually flexible to the leading of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> uh, pardon me. And uh, it means also that you are teachable. The Spirit can teach you. If you are flexible to the leading of the Spirit, you are teachable. And that really is humility. That's the, the meekness. It's... Uh, it's uh, the desire to put God first ahead of other things. So Proverbs uh, 22, verse 1. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. And, and, and a good name meaning that even humans realize that you have integrity, but you know, God knows your heart, God knows what you are, and God knows what your desires are. And he wants to give you the desires of your heart, but he is desiring that you line up those desires with his desires. And uh, God answers prayers, it's true, but, you know, he doesn't answer prayers that are not according to his will for your life or not according to the desires that he has for you. So uh, it's, uh, the issue is to put yourself in unity with God, and it takes humility to do that, to put yourself in true unity with God, so that when, when you come to him, he knows what you need before you pray, but when you come to him in a spirit of humility, then uh, truly he can give you what you desire, and, uh, you know, he can... Uh, you know, make your plans come true because they're his plans for you. And he is, he wants to prosper you. He wants to give you a life. Uh, he doesn't want you to go off and be uh, rebellious. He desires, he desires for you. He desires a sanctity for you and true life for you and, and heaven for you. That's what he desires. And that's why he made us in his image. All of these other things, the sin and death and hell, God gets blamed for that or, you know, Treat it as though it's his fault or, you know, he's the author of all those things. No, no, he's not. God wants for you. He wants sanctity. He wants life. He wants heaven for you. Uh, and he wants abundant life for you. The rich and poor meet together. So God is no respecter of persons. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man, a wise man, foresees the evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. The simple, the simple-minded. So, so the prudence means that you can spot evil. You know, you just, you kind of, have you ever had that, that sense when you walked into a room, you somehow knew something was amiss spiritually. You somehow knew that something was not right in that place. So that's foreseeing the evil and hide yourself from it. In other words, don't put yourself in that environment. If you sense that you're in that environment, the best thing is, is to turn, to do is to turn right around and leave it. And um, that's, uh, I, I think the more that you gain in wisdom and discernment of, uh, from the Holy Spirit, the more that you'll sense, you know, that this is an environment for you or this is not an environment for you. And that's, you, you know, you'll have that feeling. You walk into a place and you, you know that there's peace and prosperity, shalom, you know that there's shalom in that place. Other places you walk in and it's ra, it's chaos, it's confusion, it's lack of God's presence, no leading of the Spirit, no desire for righteousness, and, and, and you can tell. The reward of humility, 
humility, this, this meekness, this spiritual flexibility, teachability, is reverence of the Lord. See, that's the reward of humility. If you're humble, you will revere the Lord. See, so you stay right in the spiritual plane. It's not if you're humble, you will be given, a, you know, you'll be given a fishing boat or you'll be given a big mansion or, you know, this type of thing. It's, no, you'll, if you're truly humble, you will be in awe of the Lord. You will be reverent to the Lord. Uh, you will receive riches and honor and life. Now, this is spiritual first. And when, when, when God gives you something in the natural realm, it's part of the plan that he has for you. He has, he has to fund that plan. If he has a plan for your life, then he's obligated to make available to you in the natural realm the resources that are necessary for that plan. He's obligated to do that. If you're obedient to him and you're in his plan for your life, then he funds that plan. He provides all of the assets, not just money, but he provides all of the, all of the resources that you need for that plan. So that's part of the riches and honor and life, but, but you should understand these things mostly in a, in a spiritual sense, that you get spiritual riches, the prosperity, and, and honor. Uh, God recognizes your integrity and life. Life meaning not death. Thorns and snares are in the way of the deceitful. He who keeps his soul will be far from them. So that's the, the distance that you need to keep. I mean, you're always looking to witness, but you have to keep a distance from evil that doesn't want to recognize God. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So this is these are both not a natural in the natural and in the spiritual. The, the rich rule over the poor, and the, bo the borrower is servant to the lender. So these are all things that you will do. You see how, how this, this uh, uh, proverb is designed, is that uh, you get riches and honor and life and reverence of the Lord if you are humble, and then, you know, you behave a certain way. You train, you, you know, you, you behave a certain way with your children. You, you behave a certain way with other people in the community. Uh, the one who sows wickedness will reap vanity and the rod of his anger will fail. The one who has a good eye the one who is generous, the, the I in the uh, Biblical Hebrew, I often has to do with being being generous. And if you have kind of this, you know, evil eye or stink eye or whatever you want to call it, this is a cheap person. This is someone who's not very generous. But uh, the one who has a good eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Spiritually poor, naturally poor. So you've got this contrast. What does the humble person do and what does the not humble person do? What does the godly person do? What does the wicked person do? Cast out the scorner and contention will go out. Yea, strife and reproach will cease. So if you get rid of these negative elements in your life, if you get rid of the people who scorn and mock and scoff and the, the people who make fun of people you know, who are trying to seek God and trying to seek truth, then you get rid of a lot of the problems in your life. You get rid of a lot of the, the, uh, a lot of the, the, the arguments and uh, the contention in your life and the, the, the criticism and the complaints. You, it, it's a question of who do you surround yourself with, you know, and we often we say that, you know, uh, you know what, what you see is what you let into your life and what you hear is what you let into your life and that, and that's, and that of course, it applies to people. Uh, the people you let into your life, uh, they're going to have a role in defining the quality of your life. So if you let in the people who are anti-God, Antichrist, then you're going to have a life that reflects that. You have less peace and prosperity and more chaos and confusion. The one who loves pureness of heart has grace on his lips. The king will be his friend. So, so this is the contrast in this proverb, is that the humble person is getting that fruit, the positive fruit, and then the not humble person is getting the negative fruit. Grace on his lips. In other words, when you speak, you speak edification. You speak words that build people up. You don't speak words that, that tear people down. And that's something that we've all been guilty of in the faith, is, you know, saying things that tear people down, you know, and that's, it, it's... You know, we, we've, all, we've all fallen short of the mark, absolutely. Every, everyone, if you're a human born on planet Earth, you have fallen short of the mark in some way. So uh, what, the, what the objective is, and God, God can forgive all that, that's not a problem. The objective is, is to love pureness of heart, to seek the truth of the Word of God and not any kind of counterfeit, and have grace on your lips, have compassion and mercy and edification when you speak. Build people up. Don't tear them down. Don't try to make people feel... Uh, like crap because you feel so badly about yourself. You think of yourself as a piece of crap, so you want to make other people feel like crap. That's not of God. That's not of God. Lose that. That's, if you have any kind of inclination for that, lose it. It's not, not of God. Uh, 
The king will be his friend. Well, the king will be his friend. It could be that, you know, uh, people in the natural realm will appreciate you. It could be the king of kings and the lord of lords, you know, whatever. Under understand the scripture. Start putting yourself in that mentality to understand the scripture both ways. Understand it, you know, literal, natural, but also, first and foremost, understand it in a spiritual way. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthrows the words of the deceitful. So if you really are focused on God, you have knowledge, and God wants you to have knowledge uh, of the word, and from that you have faith, and you have, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, more wisdom, and you build yourself up spiritually. The slothful or lazy person says, there is a lion outside, I shall be slain in the streets. The mouths of strange women are a deep Hit. And, it, and it could be someone who is kind of a harlot or a prostitute, or it could be just some kind of a meaning. The spiritual meaning would be uh, a strange woman is uh, heresy or apostasy or departing from God. So it, it could go either way. The mouths of strange women are a deep pit. So heresy or apostasy is a deep pit. He that is aboard of the Lord, aboard of the Lord, will fall therein. So if you're, so if the Lord hates your actions. Uh, you fall into this deep pit of heresy or apostasy. That's the the, the strange women. It's not the, the, it's not literally that women are strange. I mean, it could it could in some contexts refer to a prostitute, but here it means more. Uh, it means um, just uh, d departing from the faith. Maybe some kind of apostasy. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. So a child, a natural child or a spiritual child, needs correction, and the rod of correction. The, 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 str the straight and narrow of the truth of the word of God will drive foolishness far from him. He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches will give to the rich and surely come to want. So if you, if you put your, your treasures uh, in the wrong place, if you're just trying to cater to the rich, you know, and you don't help the poor, you're oppressing the poor and God doesn't like that. He doesn't like So we'll look at one more passage now, uh, starting at Colossians 2, verse 20, and here, um, going into chapter 3, verse 12, um, maybe a little further, and th here we'll have, uh, uh, we'll have uh, more of a contrast between the true humility and the false humility, and we're, we're, we're seeking for the true humility, the true, the, the, the true meekness and, and uh, desire to be open to the leading of the Spirit, the true flexibility and teachability of uh, the disciple of the Word of God. So uh, this is now Colossians 2 verse 20. If you died with uh, Christ away from the elemental spirits of the world, the physical tangible world, why are you submitting to rules and regulations as if you were living in the world? So you've died to the flesh. Uh, so you Supposedly you've died to the flesh. And this is what happens. Sometimes people do truly believe in Jesus Christ and they are, they are reborn of the Spirit, born again and saved. But then they turn away. You know, they bear some fruit for a while, but then they turn away. But if they truly been saved, they do bear fruit, and then they should they should also come back from 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 this you know turning away. But you know, uh, uh, Paul is saying that you know you you have believed, you you have uh, uh, accepted Jesus Christ, and you you have uh, crucified the flesh. So why why do you feel obligated to follow all kinds of rules and regulations? This is man pleasing. This is not God pleasing. You should not touch, and you should not taste, and you should not handle which are all things that are meant for destruction, because they are the precepts and teachings of men. So don't let uh, people uh, hold you in bondage to a bunch of rules that they made up. Now, you know, they're, they're, uh, this, this, could be, this could be a reference to, uh, you know, certain traditions that grew out of the original law that was given by God to Moses at Mount Sinai, but, but what, what, what uh, the Spirit is talking about here is any, anything really that is man-made and imposed on man and uh, pretending to be of God, especially if it's pretending to be of God, you know, God is, is totally against that. Which rules and regulations are things indeed which have a reputation of wisdom, so in other words, some kind of, uh, some kind of legalistic behavior, which have a reputation of wisdom in self-made religion and in having an affected and ostentatious and humble opinion of one's self. But this is the false humility. This is not the true humility. 
rules and regulations put in place, we follow them, uh, you know, because we think that that's what God wants of us instead of really wanting a true relationship based on love and faith and righteousness. No, we're going to put rules and regulations in, in place, we expect you to follow them, and that that's our religion. And we're pretending that it's of God, but it's a religion, and it appears to be humble, and we uh, do things like, you know, we are severe on our body, you know, maybe, you know, doing a lot of fasting, not in any honor to God, but for the indulgence of the flesh, the indulgence of the flesh, to make ourselves look good to man and to console ourselves in the flesh. If, therefore, you were raised together with Christ, you are seeking the higher things, now this is really what what Jesus uh, was trying to teach us to do. I mean, he went, he he shed his blood, he went to the cross, and and he rose, you know, to show us that we have the victory over sin and death and hell. But really, his life was about showing us to pursue the higher things by faith, by faith in Christ, um, and obedience to the Spirit. We pursue the higher things, and there'll be a little bit more about this later on in the chapter, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So he is at the right hand of God, but he is also this, this, this is just a symbol of really the whole message of the New Testament, which is basically the Father and the Son. And we, we, want, that, we want that same type of relationship that Jesus has with the Father. Uh, we, we want that same type of, of relationship uh, with the Father, and we get it through the Son, because uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus came from the Father, so as the Son of God, you know, he was in total unity with his Father. So we want that same type of relationship with our Father by being with the Son, because the Father and the Son were in total unity. So we start with, with, with the Son. We believe in the Son for eternal life. That's, that's the name that's been given to us above all other names. You know, God uh, put himself down in, in uh, a human body uh, so that the full revelation uh, it could be given to man. The full revelation of God to man is Jesus Christ. So uh, that, that's, that, that's, how it, uh, that's how it works. We start with that connection uh, with the Son, and then we are in unity with the Father. But the Father-Son relationship, that's, that's really what we should think of, of ourselves. As followers of Jesus Christ, we should think of ourselves as sons and daughters. Not the Son, but sons and daughters who are in relationship with the Father, just as the Son is in relationship with the Father. So we are in relationship with the Son. And, and the Father. Total unity. You must continually have in mind the higher things, not the things upon the earth, for you died, and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. So you've died to the flesh. In other words, you're still, I mean, uh, this is not being uh, goofy or anything. I mean, we're still walking around you know, with human bodies, but the flesh in the sense of uh, carnal lusts, you know, lusting after the things of the world, Really, we should have died to that. If we are truly believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we should have died to those lusts. And so our life is hidden with Christ. So our life, uh, we, we, it's like we have this, uh, it's kind of like we're a double agent. We have this body of flesh and blood that we're walking around in on planet Earth. But our rea the reality of our life is really much different. It's hidden in Christ. It's all of the invisible spiritual things that we seek, and it's how we seek to ascend in that life and not worry about the life on planet Earth. We're ascending in that life, and we're, you know, whatever happens here, you know, whatever it is, however confusing it is, uh, you know, the circumstances of, of natural life, it doesn't stop us from ascending in the spiritual life. <clears throat> when uh, Christ would be revealed, the one who is your life, him, then also you will be revealed with him in glory. So when he is revealed, so when, so when you see... Christ and Christ is your life, then you will be revealed as in unity with Christ, in union with Christ. That could be now, that could be later. But when uh, Christ is revealed to you and you accept Christ, then you are revealed as being one with him. Therefore you must right now put to death the earthly parts, which are immorality, Lying, cheating, distorting the truth, uncleanness, it could be uh, you know, it, it could be sexual, it could be verbal, passion, um, passion, it really uh, excess passion, evil desires, uh, just you know wanting to do wicked things to people and say wicked things and, and hurt them and make them feel bad. Covetousness, really it's a form of uh, greed, uh, which is idol worship. It means uh, idol worship uh, 
Well, coveting is idol worship because you want something that someone else has. So that's an idol. You've turned that into your God. Whatever that person has that you want that is not God, if the, if the other person has God and you want God, that's good. But anything that's not God that someone has and you want that thing, that's covetous and that's idol worship. Because of which, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of the disobedient. So if you have these earthly parts in you and you live in those earthly parts, you reap what you sow. The wrath of God is really you reap what you sow. I mean, uh, whatever it is, however you lived your life, did you believe or not believe in Jesus Christ? And then if you believed in Jesus Christ, did you walk in the righteousness of his spirit or, or not? That, you know, you reap what you sow. If you didn't, then you'll have some measure of, uh, of, of wrath upon you. Among whom you also once walked when you were living in these things, and you also walked with the sons of the disobedient, and then you changed. You changed your mind. You were born again, and you, we all need to be born again, reborn of the Spirit. We have to change our thinking about God and Jesus Christ, and then continue that walk. So you can be born again and saved just like that. To get the fullness, to experience the fullness of that perfect salvation, then you have to walk in righteousness, walk in obedience to the Spirit. It's not an issue of salvation, it's an issue of getting the fullness of your perfect salvation by walking, walking in righteousness. And that means bearing fruit. And that means the peace and prosperity of God will be upon you. But now, then, you must immediately put everything off from yourself. Anger, get rid of all these. Anger, passion, excess passion, wickedness, depravity, just having this kind of twisted mindset, you know, always kind of, you know, uh, looking at the way things are and then portraying them some other way. Malice, you know, you want to hurt people, you want to be mean to people. Blasphemy, just, you know, mocking, scoffing, especially God. Uh, slander, uh, that's some kind of, you know, gossip that... Uh, slander is typically is not true. Sometimes gossip is true, but, you know, slander is typically something that's both gossip and it's a lie. Evil, anything wicked, not of God. Obscene, abusive speech from your mouth. And, and that's that, that that's a killer you know that'll kill people you know and and sometimes people don't even realize that uh, the effect of, uh, of what they say to, to they say to people uh, sometimes they do but a lot of times people don't they say these these things that they just they don't realize or they don't they don't even remember that they said it later but it's still I mean you, if you said it you said it it does the damage that it does right you must not ever lie to one another since you stripped off the old man with his deeds and by putting on your new self, this new mind now, under the Spirit, which is being renewed in knowledge, and according to the image of the one who created the universe, or made in his image, where there is not one Greek or Jewish, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But then Christ, Messiah, is all things to all those. So everybody can believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life. There's no distinction. You could be Jewish, not Jewish, circumcised, not circumcised, uh, it, uh, part of some, you know, totally heathen or barbarian culture, slave, free, whatever. Therefore, you must immediately put on, as chosen and beloved saints of God, once you've believed, hearts, inner thoughts, hearts, which are your inner thoughts, the real you, of compassion, generosity, humility, gentleness, patience. Now look at, humility is, is in the same... Uh, the field, the same space as compassion, generosity, gentleness, and patience. If you have true humility, you will be compassionate, you will be generous, and that was in the other passage. You will be gentle and you will have patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other if any would have a complaint against someone. Just as also the Lord forgave you, so also you must forgive. So that's a humble person can do that as well. And upon all of these, love which is a bond of perfection. And the peace of Christ must continually rule in your hearts, into which peace you were also called in one body. And you must constantly be grateful. So, so there it is. The actions of a humble person lead to unity. They don't lead to division. They lead to love. They don't lead to uh, hatred or evil or wicked things. So that's just a little bit of uh, humility, true and false, and uh, we're striving for a true humility and not false humility. We don't want to be people that just, you know, uh, are, are into following rules and, you know, bragging that we follow the rules and criticizing other people for not following rules, which are typically man-made and, uh, you know, pre 
we pretend that they're of God sometimes, but they're not. We, we want true humility. And every righteous thing that's created by God, you know, has an evil counterpart in the kingdom of darkness. So we need to be very careful about that, not just with respect to humility, but with respect to anything. There's a, there's a false gospel, a false righteousness, a false humility, a false obedience, uh, a false compassion. There's a fa Every created thing can be twisted and turned into something false by, by the kingdom of darkness and for the purposes of the kingdom of darkness. And that's the battle. That's the battle of the soul. You know, that's, that's what uh, uh, followers uh, of Jesus Christ have to be, have to guard against and, and be very, uh, be very careful about. So I'll uh, I'll stop there and uh, I'll give you your John three sixteen. I think I have all the languages here. Infatti, Dio ha talmente amato il mondo da dare il suo figliolo unigenito affinché chiunque crede in lui non perisca, ma abbia la vita eterna. Car Dieu a tant aimé il monde qu'il a donné son fils unique afin que quiconque croit en lui ne perisse pas, mais qu'il ait la vie éternelle. Seb se perandia e deshiach boten sadabirin e ti tia vetiem nindiolen tia kushto tia beson nieter Ибо так возлюбил Бог мир, что Он отдал Сына Своего Единородного, дабы всякий верующий в Него не погиб, но не в жизни вечной. Porque de tal manera amó Dios al mundo, que dio a su Hijo unigénito, para que todo aquel que cree en Él no perezca, mas tenga vida eterna. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And thank you very much, Father, for this time together, bringing us together with the word. And thank you for the people who listen. May they be blessed and edified by this message. And we ask that your blessings be upon us as we go forth into the world to execute the Great Commission. We pray these things in the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you, Betsy.